boundary control methods, inverse problems in Lorentzian and Riemannian geometry. So over to Professor Slava Kukle. So hello, thank you very much for inviting me here. And uh, I'm pleased to give a talk to such a big audience of young people, though not long enough. Uh, so um, uh, I would say that the least crucial for this course of lecture will be geometry. It's either the Romanian geometry or uh, Lorentzian geometry. I do well understand that you didn't have a crash course in, uh, course in geometry. And unfortunately, that's not crash course in geometry. It's all in the course of inverse problems in geometry. Therefore, uh, please uh, do not uh, hesitate to ask me questions. Uh, I will answer some of them and will not answer some others, just because of time. You know, if, you, if I have no five hours, I can be 15, I will answer all of them. Now, um, actually, inverse problems for Romanian and Lorentzian geometry that we are going to discuss are pretty different because Lorentzian geometry, geometry of space time, and uh, Romanian geometry, the geometry of the space itself, is very different. However, uh, I will try to, to show through my talks some similarity between the type of inverse problems related to Romanian geometry and to Lorentzian geometry that I'll be looking at. Uh, before going to, to, to the, the details, let me tell from where the similarity comes. Uh, you know, uh, Lorentz and geometry, of course, came from, from this uh, Einstein idea of the space time, right? And uh, uh, if you assume that our space time is stationary, that means that, that, means that um, it has a following form. It's not the case, but locally, for some reasonable small amounts of time, like maybe 20 million years, it is almost stationary. So, so you have that your M4, four-dimensional manifold, it is R, this time, cross some M3. So M3 is a space manifold. Uh, uh, so it's a space, three-dimensional space. So this is station space time if the corresponding matrix, the length element, V, L squared will be minus dt squared plus, well, some uh, length of dx with respect to the matrix G. G is a matrix in N. G is matrix in N, which is not independent, independent on time. Okay. So, so if N with matrix G is a Romanian three-dimensional space, and you have time, and time has different sides, right? So I'm, I, I know, I'm sure that you have heard about special relativity, right? And the we cost space, then this is M3 is just R3, and this is the usual Euclidean Euclidean matrix. Now, what is the parallelism between the studying of Riemannian geometry and Lorentzian geometry? This is a particular case of Lorentzian geometry. And if you look for the geophysics in, in this Lorentzian geometry, or more precisely, light rays, how light propagates, then you have that T will be some T0 plus initial, sorry, some initial T0 plus tau, and then X of T will be some X of T depending on the initial position at zero. So you see, the propagation of T has nothing depends upon X, and if you look for that X of T, there is no, oh, I don't hear tau, sorry. And there is no T, it's, it's parameter tau. So you can just look at that, forget about time. That means mathematically that you project the jet light geophysic onto the space M3, and this will be just usual Romanian geophysic in the, the three-dimensional space M. So once again, there, this gives you a piece for the simple example, but then you can try to, to extend it because locally everything is almost product. Okay? So it, that means that somehow the projection of the light rays onto the space looks like geophysics in the Romanian geometry. 
<laughs> that is from the point of view of geometry, from the point of view of analysis, because I'm sure I'm more, uh, you are more analysts than geometrists. Uh, both inverse problems are related to the wave propagation. Right? So wave propagation also corresponding to the uh, wave equation of the equation that we start with, and then wave propagation of the light rays in the space time. I will try to show that so the, the parallelism between the construction in the Riemann and Lorentzian inverse problems. There is still some big difference because in the case of Riemannian inverse problem, we'll spend a lot of time to do analysis of inverse problem, then go to geometry. To so geometric inverse problem. In the case of Lorentzian, from the very beginning, it's both geometric inverse problem. <coughs> now, uh, So, uh, as, uh, uh, as we have told, there will be main two topics. It's boundary control method. Boundary control method. And that is for Riemannian. For Riemannian manifolds. And it goes back to the uh, 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 pioneering paper of the edition for 87. And was then developed by many people like uh, Calab, Lasker, Eskin, and others, including myself. And then I move, I move to the passive light observation method. And this is for Lorentzian geometry. Lorentzian and for. And that was, uh, uh, it still can be, but it's going to be 13. And this is uh, Lasser, Woodman, <coughs> and myself. So this is the Lorentzian metric here. This is the Lorentzian dust, but that you mean that? Well, this particular case is very symmetric, right? I see. I felt a little bit, bit more. <coughs> yes. So that's different from. In your, in your thing, you said two things. You said Lorentzian and then. Lorentzian. Okay. Lorentzian metric, there, there is Einstein equation. So Einstein okay. theory of uh, general relativity deals with underlying Lorentzian manifold. Four dimensional. In our case, it would be okay. ten dimensional. Uh, so that's so I start now from here, and it, the, the course will be made more or less half and half, half question one, half question. Now let me first start with the following uh, following remark. Uh, you sometimes hear from the people that there is no point to study manifolds because in the real life. There are only geometries in R2 and R3. Uh, it depends upon how global is your region. Of course, locally, is every, everything is a domain in our end. But if you look at our Earth, for example, the surface of the Earth is homeomorphic to its two dimensional sphere. The two dimensional sphere cannot be represented as a domain in R2. Uh, many objects around us also cannot be, be uh, determined as, as a domain in R2. Let us Look for this funny problem. You have a leap. And leap is two dimensional object of the following form. We need a handle. Oh, maybe two handles. No. Okay? So this is, that even as a manifold, this is a complicated plus simple kinetic manifold. And there is no way to represent this domain in our field. So if you have an inverse problem, that you don't see your leap, but you, don't, you are not sure whether the handle is broken or not. You need to recover this manifold, not just a dominant in R2. But even when you deal with dominance in R2 and R3, very often the manifold approach is useful. Actually, Rabbi Shaw mentioned it when he was speaking about inverse problems for anisotropic conductivity. Uh, so, uh, 
as I say, I prefer to speak about what uh, you are actually doing next hour, about a hyperbolic approach. So let's look at the wave equation associated with isotropic figure theory. So that is something like that. solution to this equation, you just need to take u hat or yt, 
equals to u of x t when y is x step to x. So there is no way to distinguish between this and the vector activity and this loop that is coming from this and the t. So this is therefore I mean when there is no way to distinguish between something it's the best way mathematically is just to consider the problem modulus this transformation. That's it. What is this transformation? It's a change of variables. When you consider a domain in the matrix, modulus change of variables becomes manifold. There is another source of the manifolds. You know, uh, uh, in quite often you no, don't know the domain. You know only the, the exterior boundary. So that's your exterior boundary, and maybe there are folds here. You don't know where they are and how many of them are. But you make measurements only outside. What is your domain? It's not this whole one that you know. It's the one without particularly holes that you don't know. So you don't know your domain. And again, in this case, it's better to speak about unknown problem, or perhaps the worst problem for the unknown manifold. See? So, and that's what we're going to do. Now, after all this uh, wasting time. Let me ask you a question. Yes. So I know some of your work already. So I know that from the so-called Dirichlet Maimon map, you recover the topology. Yes. So if you just do measurements on the outside boundary, yes. is it enough to tell you whether the holes are there or not? Yes. There are. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I will just inform you in conference. Okay. Uh, so so let us now carefully think about the problem. Uh, I will speak about arbitrary remaining compact remaining manifolds with boundary if you just imagine the surface of the earth. Okay. So the, uh, the earth has no boundary, but all just imagine this uh, this this uh, lead of the path, right? And this is our boundary. And again, we don't know whether it has lead or somebody has two leads. We are sitting on the boundary, and all our measurements are the boundary, right? If if you can drill the earth, for example, of any depth, and this is cheap. There is no need in this right? So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So my first topic will be the boundary control method, and uh, and we deal with the Romanian manifold. I will try to keep notation n for Romanian manifold. And of course, every second time I write M, please interrupt me. So N will be Romanian manifold, N will be Lorentzian. I do not bother about dimension. It will be any dimension, even one, but one is not interesting. So let's say dimension of more than two. So I'm looking for the Romanian manifold N, N, G. N is dimensionality. So N is dimensionality. Of any capital, and you assume it's more than two. So this is remaining a compact, connected, uh, remaining manifold with boundary, the end not equal to empty set, because that's why we are going to make measurements. Again, imagine this just. As a piece, uh, as a surface of the earth, when you cut a little bit near the southern pole. I'm from the north, not right view, so I prefer to keep the north pole alive. Okay? So there is an analytic object that is related to any Romanian manifold. That, that seems, uh, this is a Romanian Laplacian. Romanian Laplacian is. Of this delta u and the local coordinates this is the following one it's one over g one half g i g one half g i j g j u now let me explain what is here so g is the you choose coordinates for example you know that from the sphere everywhere except for north and south pole, 
all of these are not cold, right? So if you sub and we say, for example, south and north pole, you can project from top to attention straight to the good coordinates. So we choose some local coordinates, and with local coordinates, the the element of the lanes would be G I G of X, G X I, G X G, right? That's how I go. Okay, the half hop. There's the lanes when you go to the direction G X I. So G X G is a positive definite symmetric matrix. I always assume it actually is more than the standard notion of. of Remaining geometry, it's not always necessary, but let's not go into this business. So then, what is GIG output index? This is just the matrix that is inverse to the, to the GIG result. In this matrix, if it's inverse, then that will be GIG with upper index. So this is called, by the way, sometimes contravariant matrices. And G is determinant of GIG. It's a very important object because it defines, this G1 half defines the volume element. So if you look for the volume element, GV, it will be G1 half of X, GX1, GXN. In which there's a measure of a small box of the size Dx. So, so the G's generator, this matrix is the interest. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> very good. Thanks. Okay. So, because, so on any Riemannian manifold, you have a natural measure, volume element, and then you have natural elbow space. So the, the norm of the function U of x squared in on m will be integral over m of q of x squared is g. And then there is a standard procedure how to define a creator given by that stuff. So uh, the, the only one thing is, we have a boundary. Right? On the boundary, we should put some boundary condition. And what boundary condition for the question we know? Hmm? So the first, the first one will be boundary condition. Boundary condition. Well, if I have a switch there, <coughs> that means you and the boundary. Aha. And, sorry. Uh, in zero or Neumann, and that is G I J. It's actually yeah. okay. G I J G I U N J on the boundary is equal to zero, and then is a is a, is a unit normal with respect to the G. Okay, so. The picture is the same, but now it's, 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 it's normal with respect to the matrix G means the following. That first of all, you have G, I, J, uh, it's actually unit polynomial, N, I, N, J equals to 1, and we have a tangent vector, T, K. Then we have that N, K by TK equals to zero. You have a tangent, factor, tangent to your boundary surface. That, that will be the vector M is orthogonal to it. So that means that it is conormal in the corresponding one. There may be other uh, boundary conditions, rotting type, mixed type. In principle, we can treat all of them. I mean, we can smooth the inverse column for all of them. I will stick mainly to this one, to the Neumann. Don't me ask me why, because in this course of lecture, I'm clear of the um, sequence. I will stick to the Neumann boundary condition. The normal derivative of the function on the boundary is zero. 
So if we look for the risk differential operator with the normal bounding condition, we call, so we get operator normal operation, okay, subject known by delta n, and from the normal, but usually we'll forget about n. It's always n. So this are, and then this delta n is self acute operator in L to n. Self acute means we can integrate by parts. So if you, you have the uh, delta u v uh, property is property is that plus part in our domain. So you have a self adjacent this operator. Remaining operation plus normal body condition self adjacent operator and has U discrete spectrum. Uh, I can't write this name, so it has to be discrete spectrum. Lambda 1, Lambda 2. This all lambdas are all negative, and, uh, and so Lambda. So here's Lambda. So, 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 uh, Lambda k tends to minus infinity. And uh, the corresponding eigenfunctions, so I have a delta phi k equals to lambda k phi k. And these functions are uh, phi k are uh, orthonormal. There are many words that I need to explain that I'm going to do. Well, to some extent, you can always consider something that you know from a piece of university. You look for the usual operation in the box. And then you know that there's eigenfunctions as signs in the X. If okay, no, if it is if the if it's known as cosine in the X by cosine in the Y. And that will be the eigenfunction. Product of the cosines in the x and y. And if you differentiate, you obtain some numbers that will give you eigenvalues. Okay? So when you speak about all, okay, if you look for the real sphere, then the eigenfunction will be spherical harmonics. Uh, well, in the real sphere, there, there is no boundary. Okay, so this is this is what is eigenvalues and the functions. And then if function says are the normal, that means the following that if you take equal over n, phi k of x. By L of X V volume, this is delta K L. And like in the usual Fourier analysis, these eigenfunctions, phi K, when you look at all of them, form a normal basis. So you can expand any function using this eigenfunction, or eigenfunction expression. So it's to totally the same as the usual Fourier, uh, Fourier uh, expansion. Because Fourier eigenfunctions, E's and cosines, are eigenfunctions responding to a special operation. I say it's a special in the box. So any, func any function A of x then has representation A k phi k of x. And now the problem is the following. And that is a problem that was form is called Dupin problem. Inverse boundary problem. Assume you have a boundary, you sit on the boundary, and you're given Dn. In this case, this is just this circle. So we don't have no idea what's inside. And you have lambda k and phi k on the boundary. That's your name. Given. Does it uniquely, does it uh, actually do it? Do the data. Do the data. Uniquely determine and. 
Now, the good uniquely determinant requires some, um, some um, uh, explanation. Uniquely determinant determinant means up to the change of, up to the different, after, uh, after isometry. That means if you have two Brevetian manifolds of the same dimension and have a map from one to the other that actually brings the metric of one manifold to the other, this will be, from, this from the many point of the remaining geometry is just two copies of the same abstract manifold. So it will be, in other ways, up to our isometry. That was, by the way, the way how, uh, how Brachtos claimed. It was exactly isometry that this change of coordinates in a given domain omega makes out of the first coordinate omega. Now, what I'll show you, and that just goes to the 92 paper of Derrish and myself, I'll show you a dance in here. And that was even the case, even if we are given only some portion of the bound. And by K on this portion. Okay, lambda K, of course. And by K on that. So, like for example, in this case, we can me make measurements outside, but can't go outside. Or we can probably make measurements only here. This is our gamma. Or maybe they are, they are sitting, yeah, they are sitting, we are living here so we can measure, measure this. Then this data determines the remaining manifold and G up to isometry. So, so this, this isometry should fix the boundary? No. Uh, isometry is identically, isometry gives you forming. You have a portion of the boundary, and this isometry, so you have two copies, say n1 and n hat. You have gamma and gamma hat. So this isometry brings gamma into gamma hat. Uh, I'm sure that, that everybody has this course on, on complex analysis. And you know that any simple, simple connected domain on the plane is equivalent to the sphere. There's a change of coordinates, a whole change of coordinates that makes the sphere. So that is, let's type of that. So you can, you can start with something like that and then you go to the sphere. Obviously they don't comply, but the correspondence is summation of the other. <clears throat> okay, so I start with, with claiming that, that I'm speaking about wave propagation. And in the funding class problem, there is not a single word about any wave that propagates anywhere. However, I can translate this Gifant inverse boundary problem into the problem related to the wave equation that is written somewhere. Yes. So let's go to the wave equation. So we associate with the uh, Laplace operator, actually you can illustrate it with any elliptic operator, the corresponding wave operator. Can I interrupt you for a minute now? So, I've heard you talk of this before. Mm -hmm. So, I've heard you say not only do you recover the isometry, you have to recover the topology of the manifold. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you do more than what you are. No, no, because you know, and you know, for this topology. So, you already have that. No, 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 no. I have all this about. Or it's in the piece of the bound. So determine N and G. So you also need to determine the amount of N. Right. You're, st you're still here. That's all you know. You don't know that's all you know. Because that's, well, you probably won't go to the opposite side of the moon or something like that. I mean, the moon has a hole. So you, you, you determine the whole manifold. Before, OK, what does that mean remaining remain manifold? It's a, a, it's a layer of structures. First of all, there's topology for that. Right? Then you add up differential structure. And then you add up the yeah. magic structure. That's exactly how they're going to reconstruct. They first recover the topology, then having the topology will recover the threshold structure, and then you put on top of the threshold structure the corresponding magic structure. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so that's we look for the corresponding wave equation. And it is 
in this cylinder. Now we need that time. In N cross R. N is X and R is time. And then we need to put initial and boundary conditions. So, boundary conditions or boundary source is associated to the boundary condition of operator. Since we are looking for the, for the Neumann condition, the, the, what we put on the boundary is the Neumann source. It's like that. Okay. If it will be Dirichlet boundary condition, it will be Dirichlet source, U equals to F. And we, of course, we need to put initial conditions. Initial conditions will be this one. And they assume that before, for time less than zero, everything was in rest. And they start hitting the wall. That is hitting the wall, right? Only at a time more than zero. So it means that F equals to zero for T less or equal to zero. And that's where we assume even more that it is smooth function. We support a little bit about T equals to zero. From the first glance, well, there should be some relation because our hyperbolic operator is based up on our uh, normal operation. Uh, so the object that you measure, really measure, is what is called response operator. So this is a well defined problem. If you know mg, you know the operation, if you, I give you f, you give me solutions. Correct? Uh, and then you can build up a map that uh, I, uh, I prefer to call response operator. So what is this map? It maps F into this, I don't, for, for simplicity, I call this thing D U U. Not correct all the time. It's actually a normal drill. So this, this guy, it just you put different sources, you, you knock the, the wall different way, and you get all possible responses. So this is a response operator. A response operator. Or, as Rakesh prefers, hyperbolic Neumann to the Rishana. Sorry, I'm wrong. Here is just you. I beg your pardon. F is just normal drill, and you imagine you. Okay? So. You put, you prescribe Neumann data and you measure Dirichlet data. So therefore it's Neumann to Dirichlet. I will also sometimes write the solution as you have. Because it's due to F. So hyperbolic, hyperbolic version of your fund in this problem is the following. Assume you know, or rather you see that this UF is zero for negative T because the solution, since you start apply an F for T more than zero, the solution goes only for positive time. So this UF is zero for T less than zero. So therefore, put here R plus. Um, so the hyperbolic inverse problem will be hyperbolic version. Oh, we find inverse boundary problem. Given Operator R to determine <coughs> energy.
The point is that this problem and the previous Gerfaz problem are equivalent. The left and right is there. And try not to keep it for a while. By ability, it means the following. Assume you, you, you know the end and you know the eigenvalues and the traces of the boundary of the eigenfunction. Then you can find this equation. Assume you give this response equation. Then you can find lambda k in uh, I will show in one direction, in the other direction, just dash to five minutes. In one direction, the following. Okay. I want to, so this operator prescribes to the Neumann source, the values of the solution on the boundary. What is the solution itself? Well, you have, if you have, if you look at this problem, if you look at this problem, and you try to fix time, now time is fixed, and that's function on, on x. And because it's function only upon x, you can expand it with the eigenfunction such. So this will be sum uk and will be for t, you write t in the function difference. I guess. And what is this uk? Uk is not United Kingdom here. There is a following formula for the UK, and it's important formula to be like BL. I explain what BL. That UFK, so if this, you remember, this was F, because it's produced by the source F. Less than t, and tau more than so. This is for tau less than t, 
I'm zero or tau one. So thank you. Of course, you can say that we assume that. So this is a Schwarz Kernel. <coughs> There's also the way, looking at this formula, there's a way you can talk about this, right? If you know R of X by T and tau, you know this operator, you can find all the under K inside K and the bar. Uh, this is a very important formula uh, that was basically the realization of, is, is one of the two pillars, two main pillars of the Valve control method and was, uh, was first done for the one-dimensional case by Bulgarischinsky. So formulas of this type are called Bulgarischinsky formulas. So, Okay, after that, let me go to the uh, principle. So now we, we, we understand what is our problem now. So I either have R or I prefer to have uh, these data to work with them. And they, we want to recover the manifold and its differential energy structure. Uh, to some extent, you'll be doing it in a constructive way, though it will be not very clear from what I've discussed. Constructive doesn't mean it's, 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 it's easy to do in numeric. It's, it's enormous in <coughs> I don't know some any good result of the one dimensional case and pretty big in one dimensional case. And the reason really is we even don't know original topology, how many handles have your body and so on and so forth. Um, body control method. So this is the method that says that was pioneered by Dredge 97 for this type of problems. Uh, let us look at this Bogavishinsky formula that gives you a possibility to, to find the Fourier coefficients of the waves inside the known manifold if you know the this special gate on the boundary. What else can we find? Well, the, the, the crucial thing is that you can find the inner products of any two waves. From PL, the Bogarichinsky formula having lambda k I k on the end. For any F and H, I can't use G because G is the metric. From C0 infinity, Dn plus R plus, we can find integral over N of U F at the time T. U H and the family for any yeah. see what is funny. You have no idea what is the way inside because you don't know where it propagates. But you still can find the single product at any time. Why? Well, it's very easy because what we know, we know the three application. Because this is just nothing else but sum from 1 to infinity u k f of t u uh, k h of x. So that's what we obtained from from uh, from uh, Bogarich's relation. This is the first pillar. Now let me come to the second pillar. That is more delicate, much more delicate. And that is the approximate perturbability. And basically, Qatar will be making the second year. Second year. 
for this image. That is going back to Kataro. You know what is important for a hyperbolic equation? The basic thing that hyperbolic equation differs from, say, elliptic or parabolic, is finite velocity of propagation. Right? Uh, and that is what, what is in this Pythagoras uh, theorem. Let me draw the picture. I draw very well. So this is our N. This is time. This time P A P zero. And this year that we have a source F which has a support in here. So it's a So we have F, and support of, support of F lies inside gamma cross 0 to 0. Actually, it can go up to P0, it can be the shell because it's fine to the propagation. So when, if you measure what happens at time P0, how your source, how you knock up to P0, nobody cares, right? So if I, if I knock, that is my gamma, and I'm knocking and knocking, and I produce acoustic wave. Acoustic wave exactly satisfies the Taylor equation that propagates. And propagates with a speed 1 with respect to the corresponding metric, metric G. So therefore, it goes further and further, and what you have is a picture like that. Okay, so then you have that uf of xt uh, is uh, support support of uf of uf will be inside this cone. So that what is this cone? It is defined as following. So for any time, x and t should satisfy the distance from the point x to gamma should be less than G. The larger T, the further we can go, correct? And at maximum, at the time T zero, when T equals to zero, the wave propagates from the gamma at the distance T zero. Agreed. This is nothing more as the fine force to wave propagation. There is no occurrence without going back to previous activity. Fancy also recreation is built in the end of the 17th century. The focus for the cases. Yeah, 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 yeah. But oh, right, of course. I mean, yeah, but I mean, people know about that. Uh, they needed energy estimates. Yes, but people knew it. Uh, oh, wow. Physicists knew it for three, three, three centuries. Okay? So, what is what is the result of Qatar? And it's very delicate result, it's the same reason. It tells you the following. As you we have our wave equation, you satisfy the wave equation inside. And you assume that that's your region, and I put it to P0, and this is T0. And that's my gamma. That's where I put all my microphones. So let u on gamma cross zero to be zero equals to the normal derivative of u on gamma cross zero to be zero equals to zero. So what we are going to do, we are making measurements on this piece. We measure the pressure and the, the, 
at the end of your piece. You and you, 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 and you don't hear anything. What can you say about you? It should be somehow related to this picture. That was the important thing. Then, the first Tataro says, then, Tataro, u of xt is zero in the double cone of infinity. It's much easier to understand it geometrically I right now. So this is this cone and backward cone. And they intersect like that, correct? In one dimensional picture will be the following the one T X, this is two T zero, this is T zero, and this is X, and you lost this one, so you get X. This is double cone of interest. Now if you want because you are analysts, and then the to be analysts as well. Uh, what is this double cone of influence? K gamma T0. It has the following formula. Now, all xt such that the distance from x to gamma plus x is greater of t minus T0 is less than T0. So that is the analytic correlation of what is this double column of the You are assuming that you have your gamma first, zero to three to seven. Which one of the laundries will take the test here? You have to call it different. So you have gamma that was the bound, remember, it's a portion of the bound. So you have this cylinder, gamma cross zero to zero. That's what they took your metal from. So you that and you find out that you that there is zero and the normal real is from this gamma t is zero. So nothing comes. Then you'd expect that you is somewhere zero, because otherwise you'll hear the signal. And Tartaro's theorem tells you exactly when, when to zero. It's in the double column of inference. Okay? Now look what happens. For example, when we hear t equals zero. When t equals to zero, then you have d plus t0 less than t0 that we go. That means that d is 0. So that means that you're sitting on the boundary. And the largest domain will be when t equals to t0. When t equals to t0, it just was discussed earlier. Uh, uh, the largest domain will be dx gamma less than t0. So this is the largest part. Okay? There is a very important Corollary of this uh, Tartaro's uniqueness theorem is called approximate transferability. That is actually what is used in the boundary control network. Um, what do you think is the problem with this one? I will use logaristic formula since we erase all this one, so I will finish with this controlling. Uh, Colorate approximate controllability. We look at this problem, and now our f is C0 infinity gamma cross T0. So our sources live in this tree. And so I have the solutions, uf of x, and I measure them at t0. And they vary f from the c0 infinity gamma cross 0 to 0. From Planck's velocity wave propagation, we know that all the waves will be concentrated in this domain of right? But now I start changing that, and I have many ways. How many? Once again, I know that if I put here f, the source living in this tree, that the time is zero, the solution.
solution will be not zero only in the dominant. But how many solutions do I get when I change that? That is the first thing. That's the first. If I take the closure in L to M of all of these sets, then what I get is L to M gamma. I need, of course, M, M gamma to zero to explain what this is. First of all, M gamma to zero is exactly this domain. So there's a cutting off of double colon at P equal to zero. So M gamma to zero of X such that the distance from X to gamma is less than the system. It can go further because it's zero further. And what is this? These are all L2 M functions. This support in M gamma. Today's lecture, let me tell why it's called approximate controllability. What is boundary controllability? You want, you are sitting on the boundary, you want to produce some wave inside that is desirable for you, right? So uh, if you have in your disposal only this P gamma T0, then you can't produce anything outside this M gamma T because then you just have no time to get there. But what inside M gamma T you can produce? And it says that you can produce almost everything. Namely, whichever function from L2 you have here, whichever epsilon you have, you can produce the wave from the boundary that is epsilon close to this desired function. That's why it's called, of course, approximate controllability, but the key is approximate the type of definition. Thank you very much.